Well, welcome this evening. It, it is a blessing to be here and to uh, see you all and your smiles. Uh, we even had someone that came to the meal tonight. I met them. And they said, I have watched your class on the streaming, and I decided I'm going to Dan Johnson's. <laughs> Literally, Beth, they told me that standing over there tonight. So tell Dan that's the second one. So he has two strikes. And <laughs> if he doesn't send one over, there used to be a game called Red Rover, Red Rover. Dan sends somebody right over, so uh, we're going to do that. Uh, godly fathering is tonight. Uh, Lord willing, next. Uh, parenting three, which is uh, getting into the, the praying, which goes not just when children are little, it becomes the most powerful tool we have, prayer especially the closer you are to your husband or wife, the more powerful the prayer gets. Jesus said, if any, what, two of you agree as touching anything, what? I'll do it. Have you ever thought about what that verse means? If you're married to a believer, it means if you're both walking in the spirit and you're sharing a burden, that uh, it's unbelievable what the Lord will do. And I'll share some stories about that. We had a son who uh, didn't think much of us for about 25 months. And uh, so we decided we'd pray for him. And after about six months, he said, you're ruining my life. <laughs> Would you stop praying for me? And uh, so it, it's very effective. Uh, the next week, we'll look at... Uh, <laughs> The Lord said it is. I mean, my anecdotal experience doesn't, you know, he said uh, that uh, he wants us to ask and seek and knock. Uh, we'll look at the myth of perfect parenting. Uh, in fact, uh, as I travel, in fact, you know, as soon as I get done here, I'm headed straight that way. I'm driving to O'Hare tonight. Um, I should get a million miles for my car, not just for flying. You know what I mean? Driving to O'Hare. But... Um, this, this session is one of the ones that, that most gets repeated. I, I speak at missions conferences and homeschool conferences and everywhere because there's so many people that are killing themselves because I think they looked at a Norman Rockwell poster or something and they think that they have to have an idyllic, perfect family. And uh, they really are killing themselves to do something that is not humanly possible. Uh, what we're looking at tonight, if you want to uh, look in your books, uh, basically uh, on page 273, I'm covering the concept starting with principle 69 that children are a gift, heritage of the Lord. And because children are a heritage from him, basically the concept is that he owns them. We're stewards. It's just like our money, only it's alive. It's a child. And children are a heritage from the Lord. He gave them to us. And so because our children never cease to belong to the Lord, look what Principle 69 says, they are to be raised according to the directives of God's word. And so we're looking at another one of those directives this evening. In fact, if you want to turn to 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9 with me, um, the element we're going to look at tonight parallels, uh, in a lot of ways, parenting itself. Um, but this is about the parent, not about the parenting. But basically, if you remember, one of the most well-known verses about parenting is that fathers are not supposed to exasperate or provoke their children to wrath, but bring them up in the what? Nurture and admonition. Nurture is the positive, and admonition could be seen as a negative. And in, in your notes, uh, I should get there so you can fill in the blanks. Uh, we, we, oh, I don't know if I have that. See, I worked too much on this this week. Well, uh, as parenting has the elements of nurture, there we go, that's the first blank. Uh, nurturing, that's encouraging spiritual obedience. And admonition, that's exposing spiritual disobedience. So we who counsel and disciple do very much the same thing. What I'm talking about tonight is the, the nurture side. And, and what, we're, what we're looking at is dads can take the challenge to bless those you love. And uh, 
Uh, basically, 1 Peter 3 gives us the components. And, and look what it says uh, in 1 Peter 3, verse 8 in your Bible. Uh, finally, uh, all of you be of one mind. Isn't it interesting? I mean, Peter could say that. I mean, that is the solution to family distresses. He says, all of you be of one mind. Isn't that interesting to think about? Most of our problems are uh, we have too many chiefs and not enough what? Yeah, we just aren't willing to mutually submit to one another, so we, we don't, we're not all of one mind. But finally, be of all one mind, having compassion for one another. Uh, remember the word compassion, it, it's, it, the word is the Greek word for intestines. And the reason that is, is in the Greco-Roman world, they did not think that the seat of the emotions was the heart. They thought it was the, the intestines. And that's because, you know how you're going in for a job interview, you ever felt that, you know, and everyone gets a stomach ache, you know. They thought this is where our feelings are lodged, in the intestines. And so, so that is a very graphic word. The word compassion means you feel in your intestines for someone. Now, can you imagine this coming February 14th <laughs> to buy your wife a chocolate, large or small intestine? <laughs> would she get the message? I mean, but in the first century, she would have just ran and hugged you. Because that's what compassion meant. It, it was here in, in, your, uh, in your intestinal uh, area was your compassion, the seat of your compassion. But feel what he's saying. Feel this compassion, which, by the way, was the most recorded emotion of Jesus Christ. That word right there, compassion. When Jesus Christ's life was written down in the Gospels, if you read them through all 89 chapters, the most recorded emotion of Christ is right there. It's compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tender-hearted, uh, not returning evil for evil. One of the evidences of being filled with the Spirit is when someone throws something at you verbally or otherwise, you absorb it and don't throw it back. You catch it. You don't return. Look what it says. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling. I mean, you say something about me, I'm going to say it back. Uh, I'm going to revile you back. But on the contrary, blessing. Now, see, that's, that's men, as we examine God's word, ask yourself, am I doing this? See, the context of this is, look at where this starts. Verse 7. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessels, being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. And finally, all of you be of one mind. And so the context is, he's talked about how the wives are to be, and he spent a lot of verses about there. And then he zeroes in on the husbands, and then he comes back and he says, building on that, you need to be what it says in verse 8 and 9. All of us, but in the context of tonight, of applying this to husbands. Because sometimes they have the most trouble doing this. So, men, as we examine God's word, ask yourself, am I doing this? Doing what? Verse 9. On the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. And then comes this beautiful quotation uh, from the, the Old Testament, in fact, from more than one passage, uh, that, that if we love life and want to see good days, refrain your tongue from evil, your lips from speaking guile, turn away from evil, do good, seek peace, pursue, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. That's the ant farm verse. Remember I've told you that we're like in an ant farm? And God's eyes are always watching us. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. So, basically, godly dads bless their children and wives in three ways. By time invested in them, that's the first way you can bless someone as a godly dad. By a lifestyle as a servant, and we're going to look at all these tonight, and by words of blessing. And that's what we're really going to focus on tonight and actually practice at the table. My goal is to get done enough, and it doesn't matter if you're dad or a husband or what, but for all of us to practice words of blessing. In fact, this is fascinating to do. I've, I've done it for years. I love to get, you know, and it started here on the staff. Um, we had the first birthday after I came on staff here, and so 
Dan Johnson told me I could do anything I wanted to do with the staff because, you know, he, he was uh, leading the staff and, and helping me and I said, okay, this is what I want to do. I said, we're all going to stand around that person. You know, we, we come out to the front office for five minutes and there's a cake there and, you know, we have this little break. It's their birthday and he said, and he looked at me and he says, what are we going to do? And I said, I want all of you to share one way and I think it was Nancy Neeland, I said, it was her birthday, that Nancy's life has blessed you. And people went. <laughs> I said, and I'll start. And I said, Nancy, you're always here before me, you're here after me, and you go toward people. When people come to the, you know, if you're the receptionist, if, if you don't act like you want to go toward them, they'll feel unwelcome. And so she'd just say, hey, hello, you know, and stand up. And, and, uh, and then they got the idea. And so they went all the way around the room. Do you know what started happening? People started crying. Do you know how rare it is to have someone say how your life has blessed them? Do you know what's better than telling employees that? Tell your wife or children. That. See, that's this idea. Words of blessing spoken aloud to those they love. God will not ask how profitable your company was, how successful your investment strategies were, how well your building projects went as men. But he will say, I called you to be a blessing. How'd you do at that calling? So that's something for us to really think about. And our shared calling is... Uh, is beautiful. In your notes, I, I typed out, and you can see it, the New American Standard on the next page. To sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly. In fact, I even have it here on the screen for you, but it's also on your sheet. Uh, sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. See, I like the way the New American Standard puts it, giving a blessing. Uh, not just being, giving it. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. So remember the Lord says, with the same measure that, that you measure, it's going to be measured to you again. Have you ever thought about that? How, how parents that, that, that are um, vitriolic in their, in their talking to their children, they wonder why it comes right back. You understand what I mean? This, this is irresistible in the long... Remember I told you about the 25 months, the son that didn't really like me? Um, he didn't like anything, to tell you the truth. Uh, we, we, had, uh, we, we learned a lot through that. But what we had to do is not return. You know, his, he would insult his mother. We would only by the Lord's strength. Certainly I wouldn't do it, but the Lord gives us the grace to give a blessing instead because we're called for that purpose that we might inherit a blessing. Well, here, let's start. Uh, our first challenge is how to bless them by our time. And uh, what I have for you here, it's printed out in your notes, but I always have it taped in my Bible. So I'm gonna read it to you. Uh, this, is, this was my very first Father's Day when I lived in California, and uh, in fact, I was teasing, uh, we sat almost where John is. Are you still at the same table? That's where we were sitting, wasn't it, for dinner with your family? So John Jones is over there. I sat down with my son, and John and his family came up, and their, their twin girls and their three little boys, and I said, oh, leave them here. I said, I'll watch him. I said, Elisha can change their diapers. He's, he's a master at that. And he looked at me, and he went, Dad, I've never changed a diaper in my life. I said, it's a joke, honey. They wouldn't let you. You know, <laughs> Did you know new diapers have little strips, color strips? Did you know? None of you. I mean, it's amazing. We had cloth ones that were this big, and you had to <laughs> fold them down to the right size or just wrap them. You know, I, I learned what swaddling clothes meant. You know, I didn't know how to fold them the right way. But... Uh, What's amazing is when you get that first child, it's, it's a wake-up call. And so at Grace Community Church, they passed out the Dobson track, and I still have it. Actually, it fell apart, so I typed it. My family's all grown. The kids are gone. But if I had to do it all over again, this is what I'd do. I'd love my wife more in front of my children 
and you can read the rest. I would laugh with my children more at our mistakes and our joys. I would listen more, even to the littlest one. I would be more honest about my own weaknesses, never pretending perfection, because if we do, they will. And then we'll never be able to help them. I would pray differently for my family. Instead of focusing on them, I'd focus on me. And I would do more things together with my children. In fact, that's what Bonnie and I decided. We would do everything with our children. And so the problem we had is our children grew up not knowing they were children because they always sat at tables with adults from their, I mean, from when they sat up onward. And, and they just would look at them and talk with them. I remember Estelle before, I, she used to be in the, when she was small enough to fit in the shopping cart seat laying down. Now that's small. She'd lay there and be looking around and, and the, the cashier would look down and say, what a cute baby, and she'd say, thanks. And you know, I mean, it was just amazing. They just talked uh, because they were around people all the time and they learned to talk. I would encourage them, and, and the lady said, how old are you? And she said, one. She was actually 23 months, but she wasn't two yet, so she was showing off uh, the sin nature. I would encourage them more and bestow more praise. I would pay more attention to little things like deeds and words of thoughtfulness, and there's scriptures all the way through this. And then finally, if I had to do it all over again, I would share God more intimately with my family. Every ordinary thing that happened in every ordinary day I would use to direct them to our very extraordinary God. So um, bless them with your time. Uh, just decide. I remember we, uh, when I was at Grace Community Church, the office next to me was a guy named Gary Ezzo, and he wrote a parenting program called Growing Kids God's Way. And uh, that was back in the 80s. And, um, and I remember Gary used to be typing, when there used to be typewriters, and he'd be typing that parenting thing and he'd come over and he'd read it to me and say what do you think and and one of the things he said is he called it couch time and he said the first thing you do when you get home from work is you tell the kids mom's most important sit on the couch with her and tell them to wait until you're done and he said it sets in the kids mind it sets aside their mother is very special to their father and in your wife's mind or their mother's mind it sets aside that the greatest um, kind of priority a husband has coming home from work is to catch up with his wife. Oh, is that hard. But we really got used to doing that. And, and it got to the point where our kids would see me coming and they would all run to mom and say, go sit on the couch. He's coming, you know, and, and, uh, and, and I would sit there with her. But you can read all the rest of that. But how to bless them by your lifestyle. And this is the second one. Um, always remember the power of servanthood in the life of believers. Servants of God last forever. If you look in the Bible, in Revelation, in chapter 22, all that's left are two things. God and his bondservants. Isn't that interesting? The, the theme of that 22nd chapter is God and we're serving him, his, his servants. And servants of God last forever. And the greatest husband is the one who is the greatest servant. And the best wife is the one who is the best servant. And the most wonderful children are those who have servants' hearts. The same goes for the happiest marriage, the healthiest homes. If you want to excel in whatever work you do or relationship you have, you have to be God's servant. Now look at these, and I underlined some verses in there for you. Matthew 20, 25, Jesus called him and said, You know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. I'll never forget my first pastorate. I went out with the, what did they call him? He was the, uh, not the moderator. I don't remember what he was, but it was, uh, he was the head of all the boards in the church. Um, I don't remember the title. It was in New England. But uh, he was the top dog. And all, the deacons, the trustees, and the executives were all under him. But, and his name was Octavius Rodriguez Augustus. That was his name. He was a descendant. Uh-oh, my battery ran out, but that's okay. Uh, he was a descendant of the Caesars. He was from the Azores. He actually was a Roman. But the reason I'm telling you that is, and I love him. He became one of my dearest friends. 
But he did something that marked me for life. We went out to breakfast in New England and ordered our breakfast. And he's one of those that he gave about 42 instructions. I like the bacon flat, medium well done, no grease. I would like the rye toast, uh, firm, not curled, not overdone with, uh, with too much. There you go, thanks. Mm -hmm. I can talk, well here, I'll just go like this. Yeah. I'm gonna hide, uh, Rob. And uh, I, you know what I mean, in, in his eggs had to be this way, this way, this way. That poor waitress probably was in high school. And I mean, she couldn't write 42 things down. She brought back his bacon, rye toast, and eggs. And he gave her the absolutely most withering look and mercilessly sent everything back to her. I was planning on leaving a gospel track. <laughs> I didn't. Because he did not, in that moment, portray Christ. Don't share gospel tracts if you're not going to have a servant heart. Look at verse 27. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Wow, you are amazing. Thank you. Yay. For Rob. Did you know that he doesn't just play the drums well? He serves well. And I host two of his family members. Uh, Rob and Kathy sent two of their family members to my house. And they've lived there how long now? A year. year. If you want to know about it, ask them. Very special members of their family. They have real long horns. Um, okay. It's the, the, the lifestyle of being a servant is, is overwhelming. On uh, yesterday, I guess it was, we had a staff retreat, the pastoral staff, and, and it was also Jeremy Willett's birthday, so we took him to Red Robin as a staff. And, and, and part, you know, I'm, I'm, some of them are new pastors. Jeremy and Justin are very new. And, I mean, Dave isn't that old of a pastor. Jeff's a wizard, you know, he's been 40 years here. But the other three I'm, I'm kind of nurturing. And I decided that, that I was going to teach them something at the, at the Red Robin. And so uh, I was waiting to see if any of them were going to witness the waitress, and nobody did. So she came by, and I said, um, do you know anything about these men at the table? And she looked at me a little, you know, like I was going to tell her something. I said, they're all ex-cons. Her eyes got this big, and she stepped back away from the table. I said, every one of them are convicted sinners. Well, then, you know, when I added sinners, she, she couldn't figure out what I was talking about. And, and so she stepped a little closer, and she said, well, maybe I should tell you something. She says, my life has been empty. She's a Western student. She said, I feel out of touch with everything, even God. And she said, I've been asking him to help me. And she said, when you convicts came in, I felt something. <laughs> and I said, I said, you know what? We would like, and, and by then, uh, Phil McCune was, remember I tell everybody to take out their track? Well, I had already given mine out. He has waited too long for his. Have you ever seen something that's been too long in a man's wallet? <laughs> It looked like the Magna Carta, you know, that from the Museum of Britain. But it was still a track. It was all, you know, it, it was crinkled and, and smudged. But boy, she just thought that was a treasure. And I pulled that out and I said, what I mean by ex-convicted sinners is every one of us are guilty sinners, also distant and far from God. But all of us have been forgiven. And boy, they, you know, they caught what we were doing. And, and I didn't have to say another word. And everyone started talking. And she wanted to find out, you know, because Justin's a college pastor. And she was so excited about that. And, you know, Dave was sharing with her. But we have to go out Christ-like. Uh, I mean, what I could have told her is that she really didn't give me what I ordered. Right? And, and you know what I mean? You, there's a lot of things you can do to those poor people who are trying to be waitresses. But if you're going to try and share the gospel, then 
than be a servant. Then it says in Matthew 23, uh, do not be called teachers. One is your teacher is the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. So how to bless them by your lifestyle? Be a servant. And you can read all the rest in your notes there. Uh, but servants of God uh, live for others. That's the key. Remember, look not every man in his own things, but every man also on what? The things of others. Servants of God are living for others. We're looking at life, at how we can impact, serve, help, share the gospel, share the burden, or even absorb the reviling from others. So, Jesus called us to be the greatest possible people for him. He defines greatness in relation to servanthood. The way that we are great to God is to be a servant. And if we apply that principle, there you go. Uh, the be the greatest husband, be the greatest servant of your family. The greatest dad, the greatest servant, uh, I mean to your wife as a husband and to your family as a dad. To be the greatest son or daughter, be the greatest servant to your parents. See, all of a sudden, uh, what happens is it, the kids catch this. In fact, uh, remember Sunday we canceled because of the storm. Y'all remember that? Well, we had this missionary that was supposed to speak in evening service, and we had already had a 5 o'clock reception with him, so we came over and braved our life, and, I mean, trees were falling down. One fell on 657, boom, a 40 or 50-foot oak, so we had to turn around and go the other way. And, and actually, we were driving over branches. It was really interesting over that way uh, toward the west. But we got here, and we started setting this up. Uh, we were in the lobby, and people started filtering in, and... One of them came over to me and they said, you know what, this is really fun to watch. Because we had uh, Elizabeth, Joseph, Elisha, Estelle, Julia. Five of the eight were there. And without even saying anything to them, they were just like this. They were all doing something. You know, they were taking something from Bonnie and setting it up. And one of the people pulled me over and they said, they said, how do you get them to do that? And I said, get them to do that. I never even thought of getting them to do that. They grew up always helping. They were not allowed to think that you didn't. It's kind of like going to church. That was never an option to stay home. I mean, you had to be in traction to stay home from church in our family. I mean, you brought your bowl and, you know, not really, you know, you're, come on. You can tell when Bonnie's not here, I get carried away. Uh, because when she's here, I, one look at her and she's going. Okay, here we go. Next, servants of God look like Christ. Jesus said the greatest is a servant, and the greatest servant was Christ, and how did he serve? His entire life was as a servant who served. Um, and here you go. He gave his life, and so as his servants, we are to be a living sacrifice. That's how you apply a living sacrifice, uh, as Paul called us to. He led his disciples, so as his followers, we're to be a servant leaders. In fact, the, the greatest passage on church leadership is 1 Peter 5, where it talks about elders are, and, and in 1 Peter 5 it says, the, the word is to wrap a servant's apron around. Do you remember when Jesus washed the disciples' feet? It says that he took off his outer garment and wrapped a towel around, gird himself with a towel, and knelt down at each of the disciples' feet. And the Greek word for taking the towel, it was like a long towel that you wrapped around you so part of it you know, was still hanging there. So it was kind of like you were a paper towel dispenser. And as you knelt down, you washed their feet, and you had this towel so you could wipe their feet. And it became known as... The sign of a servant is the one who would wrap the towel around and have it hanging down so that they could be the portable paper towel dispenser. You know, they served everybody else and let them wipe their dirty feet on them. And that's what a servant leader is. It, it's not anything less than actually serving. And that's the greatest servants are supposed to be, of course, the, the leaders. And, uh, and he encouraged his own. And we're going to see that in just a moment. So... Those are the words you need for there. Here's the third one, if you turn the page. Bless them by your words. And this is what I really am focusing on. I'm just going to buzz through it tonight because I know you know how to read. This is the New Testament ministry of blessing others. And so what I'd like to talk to you about, the last sight that all the disciples had of Jesus. Have you ever thought of that? What was his last act? I can still remember the last moment my mother was alive and the last moment my dad was alive. There's something about those last moments you never forget. 
What did they never forget about Christ? Well, right here he is. You shall receive power. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. Be my witnesses. And when he had spoken these things in verse 9, while they watched, he was taken up. Well, we, so was that the last thing he did? Well, no. If you look, do you remember Luke and Acts are, are a continuation? Luke continues into the book of Acts. You can actually, they fit together. And if you take, because Luke wrote both of them under the inspiration of God's Spirit. If you take Luke 24 and overlay it with Acts 1, you find out what was going on. And, and this Acts 1.8 took place right after this. He led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And I mean, can you imagine? You know, uh, sometimes when we're singing, uh, some of the songs are so moving, you can get teary-eyed. But can you imagine standing there and having Jesus lift his hands, and what would you see? What would you see? Yeah. Can you imagine that? seeing those hands that were nailed because of our transgressions and he's lifting those things up. You can't take your eyes off of them. And he's holding his hands out. And what did he do? And he blessed them. Look at verse 51. Now it came to pass while he... What's he doing? He's got those hands out and he is pouring out words of blessing on them. He's saying, hey Peter, you've put your foot in your mouth a thousand times. But I'm going to use you. Thomas, you got it now? You still doubting me? Good. You, you see, he just went around. You know, Andrew, you're always bringing people. Keep doing that, okay? Matthew, you know, you're always counting everything. You're a tax collector. Keep counting them as they come in. But while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. The last sight the disciples had of Christ was looking at those hands as he rose up out of sight, blessing them. He didn't ever stop. It just got fainter and fainter until finally he just was gone. It's amazing to think about. That's the answer. What was Christ's final action on earth? Look at your notes. Those men would never forget walking with Jesus for three and a half years. They'd never forget his death, burial, and resurrection. But what would be riveted in their minds? It would be that incredible moment of the last time they saw him here on earth. Their friend, their savior, their most precious Lord of all, left them in a most touching way. He lifted up his hands and touched them with his blessings. Think about that. Jesus was very careful with what he did as he left his disciples. And that's the picture they would have deeply etched in their minds. Is Christ's loving, prayerful blessing raining down upon them as he was lifted out of sight. Those words of blessing raining down upon them must have been remembered over and over in the days of head. Because words have such a power for good or evil. Jesus said the way up is down, the way the top is the bottom, and the way to greatness is servanthood. So, the powerful gift of blessing those we love. Uh, and basically, uh, what, what the notes say you can read, and uh, let me give you the fill in the blanks. Blessing often involves touching. You can look at how Jesus did this. I mentioned that last week. Uh, blessing often points to the future, you know, that, that there's a great uh, future and hope for you, as the Lord told Jeremiah. Blessing is usually hard, but it's very rewarding. Remember, bless those that persecute you and revile you. So it involves touching. It points often to the future and it's usually very hard. Uh, Jesus next ends his earthly ministry with the most vivid memory that we just covered. Paul repeats it. You see that? Uh, there was a, a spirit uh, prompted work of blessing that the early church services had. You can read that. 1 Corinthians 14, 16 says... Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks, since he doesn't understand what you say? Now, this is talking about regulating the whole spiritual manifestation of gifts, but did you understand what one of the things they were doing as they were practicing their gifts is they were blessing one another. That was a part of the church service. Amazing how that's why those people did so well. They weren't all spectators. Did you know church has gotten to be a spectator sport? It's like football. 
we all get our seats. You know, and some people have those little back things, you know, and other people have their cooler, you know, and, but they're all there at the game. But only the people on the field do anything. Everybody else is watching. And they had a work to do when they came to church. And you can even read, even the Old Testament, how all those. Um, just another fill in the blank. Old Testament blessings. Uh, look at the Aaronic blessing. Tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you're to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you. See, we can't bless people. We can use our, our mouths, our voices, we can harness our words to do what God wants us to do, but all they are are words until it's the Lord that blesses and keeps and the Lord make his face shine on you. See, that's what the, when we bless people, when, when we go around, you know, in staff meeting and say, this is, how we, this is how we see the Lord in your life. We're blessing them by, by affirming the fact that God is using them. And you've got to connect whoever you're blessing to the Lord. Uh, and then, this is the ultimate part of blessing. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Do you see the greatest, the greatest element of blessing is that, that when, when we're doing this, we're saying this isn't normal human. This is the Lord prompting this. It's the Lord that makes me want to do this. And that's how we put his name on the ones that we serve. And it's, it's an amazing thought. Okay. Um, following Christ's example, and uh, that's the last one, and you can read it. Um, I'll read it for you. Commit to never forget Christ's final action on earth, dads, to his loved ones. He lifted up his hands and touched them with his blessing. Think about that picture as they would have had deeply etched in their mind. Christ's loving, prayerful blessing raining down on them. Is that what your kids remember? You know what's etched in their mind? I hope it's not red-faced, bulging veins, bugging eyes, screaming. That doesn't really accomplish much. This is Christ's example. Now, we all have flesh and we're all human. Uh, and, and I would say that I have probably apologized to my kids thousands of times. You know, we have other families of many in the back. Right, Dave? We're at thousands because we have exponential relationships. When you have, it's not like having one child. It's just parent to child. You only have really, you know, very few little lines of communication. But as soon as you add each child, it's just exponentially multiplied. And there can be so many ways that we can do stuff wrong. And so every time we're not Christ-like, we say, I'm sorry. That was not the way Christ would have parented you. And, and maybe what I did was right, but the way I did it was wrong. Now, I'm, you know, you're still going to get it, but I'm, <laughs> but I'm sorry, you know, for the way I did it. So, following Christ's example. Now, for our, our tables, we have 12 minutes. What I'd like you to do is maybe back up to uh, the Luke 24. And why don't you practice? I mean, you guys have, you've at least sat together for, you know, an hour. Think of something that, that you can say about the person at the table. Practice this blessing thing. Or, or you can just do someone that's not there. Bless your children that aren't there. But we need to practice with our mouths learning how to do this. And, and it feels very uncomfortable. But uh, if your husband or wife is there, practice at the table. Um, I do this all the time with couples. I say, give me three reasons why you love them. And they go, uh, uh, right now? <laughs> Out loud? <laughs> me? I go, yeah. I mean, I could give you 500 reasons I like Bonnie and love her. And, and, but I practiced for 30 years. So let's practice at the tables, okay? God bless you. Let's talk about being a blessing.